absorb all the knowledge that you get the chance to be exposed to, because you never know when that knowledge might come in handy someday. This is our humble hemp patch. 5,000 years of medical cannabis use. We're learning about other cannabinoids. Marijuana is grown in every state in the union. I'm Lex Pelger, Director of Education at CV Sciences, and this is The Lex Files. Today we speak to the scientist Kyle Boyar about the testing of cannabis. He shares about his journey from hosting electronic music events, to study neurology, to his current role in cannabis chemistry. When this interview was recorded, Kyle worked at Medicinal Genomics, a company that sells cannabis testing kits to the public. But since then, Kyle's become the Director of Product Science at Tagleaf, a software company that has developed a laboratory information management system for cannabis testing labs. It's geared towards keeping labs both transparent and compliant. Congratulations, Kyle. Today, we'll be hearing about the kits sold by medicinal genomics that you can use to identify your plant's gender and to explore its microbiome. Kyle will explain how those tests work and the history and development of techniques behind them. You don't need a science degree to grow cannabis, and as Kyle says, these test kits are designed for everyone. And for any consumers of cannabis, it's good to know how your products are being tested and what that really means. In addition to his job, Kyle also supports the cannabis science community in various ways. He volunteers at the American Chemical Society's Cannabis Chemistry Subdivision, known as CAN, where he serves as their vice chair and as the chair of their scholarship committee. With all of these angles, we're very glad to get Kyle's insights into the world of testing cannabis. But before we start, we should define a couple of terms that get used. Matrix, or its plural matrices, is what we call the material being tested. The matrix might be the cannabis flower, it might be an edible brownie, or it might be a concentrated extract. The matrix is the material that's holding the cannabinoid molecules. Then a PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, is a widely used and hugely important lab technique that amplifies very small amounts of DNA. For cannabis plants, these tests directly analyze the DNA from the plant itself, but they can also be used to identify the microbes present in the plant to see if they're good, bad, or benign. Speaking of which, when you say a bacteria is aerobic, that means it needs oxygen to live. Anaerobic bacteria do not need oxygen. And then in lab techniques, when you sonicate a mixture, it means that you're hitting it with sound waves to mix it more thoroughly, which is a very cool technique. Uh, a plate is just as it sounds, it's a flat surface to hold chemical reactions. And then columns are the long tubes that are packed with material called the stationary phase. This is where the separation takes place. The stationary phase is the material in the column that makes the sample stick to it to separate out the various molecules. And lastly, a pipette is like a turkey baster for transferring liquids. At science speed dating events, your pipetting skills might be something that comes up. Now, to share more on the science of cannabis testing, here's Kyle Boyar. Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to have Kyle Boyar here. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me today, Lex. I was curious about how you got into science in general. It was neurology that you first studied, but when did you know that you wanted to be a scientist? Um, well, so I guess that's a... An interesting question. So um, I've always been fascinated with the brain in general. Um, so that's kind of where the neuroscience came in. Initially, I was actually going to be an environmental studies major, um, just because, frankly, that's what I was good at in college, or sorry, in high school. Um, and, uh, you know, I was getting, you know, fives on my AP tests and environmental. And then really, when it came down to it, um, one, it's, it's sadly a little bit of a depressing subject, right? I mean, where we've got things like Trump nixing the EPA, essentially, and cutting all funding for that. Um, and ultimately, we're, we're really losing that battle. And yes, while I'm passionate about the environment, um, I just don't really see myself, or I didn't at the time, see myself as pursuing a career in that space, although I was really good at it and was interested in it to, to a degree. But uh, I thought, you know, well, it's another type of science, and it's a much harder science, but why not explore the brain a bit more? Um, just because, you know, what, how do we perceive reality? How do we, how do we take this human experience and translate it into, um, you know, what, what we have today um, as, you know, society builds and just in general, all the intricacies of it. It's just like a super fascinating area. So I decided to go for the neuroscience degree at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and I was there for four years doing my degree. Meanwhile, I was actually throwing events at the time, 
Um, and I ended up meeting with one of the owners of a testing lab at one of my events um, and basically was like, look, I'm about to graduate with a neuroscience degree and um, I don't have a ton of lab experience, but uh, you know, I, I hear from a friend that you run a cannabis testing lab. So, um, you know, I think I'd, I'd be a good fit for you because I'm, I'm hungry, essentially. Um, and basically after uh, he said, you know, you know, I'm totally interested in having you like, and so followed up with them um, and really didn't get much traction after following up. And so they weren't very far from uh, the college I was at. So I just drafted up a resume and showed up at their door and um, told the owners there that, you know, hey, uh, I met one of your co-founders the other night and he said I would be a good fit and I haven't heard back from him, but uh, I want this job doing cannabis testing. And so uh, they interviewed me on the spot and uh, got the job pretty much right then and there. So that pretty much launched my career in cannabis testing. Uh, for all you students out there, there's the secret. Persistence. It's key. <laughs> and, and networking. Um, what kind of events were you throwing? Uh, so these were electronic music events. Um, so I, this was in Santa Cruz, California. And um, yeah, I, I used to have a lot of fun out in the forest. And this was actually my first event really in a formalized venue. So this was at the Catalyst Club in downtown Santa Cruz. Uh, it's always fascinating how many scientists have such a strong artistic uh, background to them. Do you feel like that still influences your work and thinking, uh, your artistic background? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I get a lot of inspiration from music and art in general. Um, and it's inspiring because the, at the time, this was like when electronic music was starting to become the next big thing. So since then, I've kind of watched a lot of the people that I grew up throwing events with um, blossom into these just fantastic artists. They're now headlining all these massive festivals and they're they're experiencing all the success in the world. And it's very cool to see that now come around to the cannabis field. Uh, for a while, it was like, wow, you know, I, I hope one day I get my time to shine like these guys. <laughs> and here we are now, um, and the field is really blooming. So it's really cool to to finally have that all come around and get to share some of that success like uh, a lot of my friends have had in their respective industries. Um, to get back to your science, I it's, a, it's such an interesting jump to go from neurology to analytical chemistry because they sound like they might be somewhat um, akin to each other, but when you really get close to it, they're very different fields. What was it like for you to switch to something like that and with that kind of learning curve? Um, well, to be honest, it wasn't uh, a super easy transition. I was stuck in and molecular biology land, um, you know, doing PCRs and doing transformations and uh, running gels and all that kind of stuff. And then when you get into chemistry more, it's, you know, all right, well, polarity and, you know, interactions with columns and figuring out the right detector for the right job. Um, and yeah, it was, it was definitely a very, very different field and realm. Um, but, you know, do you take baby steps? I started off as a laboratory technician. I, I definitely didn't just jump into this and become a, a, you know, a lab manager or director right off the bat. Um, so, you know, it was, it was really learning in the mentorship that I got uh, at my first job at SC that uh, taught me really how to think like a chemist and how to apply you know, those principles in order to get the correct answer. So yeah, it was definitely not something that happened overnight and it took a lot of hard work. And at the time, I mean, really the field was so brand new. I mean, like there were very, very few methods out there and heck, I feel like nobody even knew what the heck a validated method was at that time. Um, so, you know, we've really come a long way since then. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I, all I could say to it is just that it, it takes a lot of hard work and, like you said, persistence and also just being good with working with people and being a sponge, really. Absorb all the knowledge that you get the chance to be exposed to because you never know when that knowledge might come in handy someday. Hmm, that's good advice. What kind of techniques were you using? I mean, what, what happens in a lab like SC Labs, um, especially in the early days for the methods they use and the kind of work you would be doing? Um, so, I mean, very early on, it was, uh, it was like, for example, potency prep um, was, you know, simple, uh, take your sample size um, and you have to figure out the right mass for it, right? Because you have all these different matrices with all these different concentrations. So you have to tease out the right sample mass in order to 
ensure that you're within the range of your calibration of your instrument. So uh, to give the example of potency, like I was saying, um, you take your sample, uh, you would dilute it in your solvent, um, and then you have to figure out a technique to actually thoroughly and completely extract all the cannabinoids from the matrix that you're testing. So that comes with trial and error too. I mean, again, this is, no one really had standardized methods or guidelines, and we don't really even have a lot of those today. I mean, AOAC has made some good progress on potency methods for things like flour and concentrates, and I believe they've done one for chocolate as well. Um, but a lot of this was just kind of figuring this out on our own. Um, but we'd take that that sample, we'd uh, you know vortex, we'd sonicate, we'd do whatever we could in order to extract those cannabinoids out of the matrix. And then you dilute it to the appropriate concentration, and that just depends on what you were dealing with. Um, and then you basically take that, put it into a two mil auto sampler vial, and uh, you get your injection and uh, have your your different methods set up to to basically separate out the different cannabinoids. And you have, of course, your your different standards, and you calibrate and make sure that everything lines up correctly. Um, integrating the peak the correct way, making sure that, and I mean, software does that today, no problem. But this was like, you know, this was very early on when we just kind of had wh whatever was available to us. So um, there was a lot of learning involved um, in figuring out what the ideal methodology was and the best way to really approach getting the right answer. It sounds like it is so tricky, uh, even for testing regular cannabis flower, which is kind of the easiest test. It's still, you can get results all over the board. And then I've often heard that edibles in any form are the hardest thing to test because getting all the cannabinoids out using all the methods can be really tricky. Oh, for sure. Like um, to give you a classic example of why infused products are so tricky. I mean, think about, um, you know, just when you're trying to homogenize something like that, um, what ends up in your solution? What does that solution look like at the end of the day? Well, it's frankly, filled with a lot of particles that are a giant mess. And who knows if you actually got a complete extraction or not. Um, to give, a, I'll give some little uh, nuggets of knowledge here, like for example, with um, chocolates. Now, of course, this method won't work for something that's not completely decarboxylated. So, and again, this was also the early days, but for chocolates, we found, um, in addition to sonicating, you also got to apply some heat in order to really get a full release of those cannabinoids into the solution. Um, and then other matrices also pose tricky problems. Like uh, one example of that would be, um, let's say you're doing like granola or something. Well, you have tons of little particulates in there. So unless you want to completely mess up your column by injecting this stuff directly onto it, um, what you would do is make sure that you filtered your sample properly so that you're not gunking it up. And if you are going to be, you know, if you are going to have a messy matrix like that, you want to ensure that you have the appropriate measures in place so that you're not wrecking your column that costs hundreds of dollars. Um, so putting things in like a guard column to protect that column and make sure that anything that is going to go in there that would cause problems is getting caught before it actually ends up onto the column. And then you have to spend hundreds of dollars to get a new one. Oh, man. It must have been a learning curve. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think uh, with the new onslaught that we're seeing of everyone trying to get into cannabis testing, there's so many people without this knowledge and experience that, that haven't lived it yet. And so for all you big money people out there that just think that you're going to walk in and this is going to be a cakewalk and you're going to make millions, uh, my advice is best of luck to you. Uh, better hire someone with some experience. <laughs> um. So at SC Labs, you got to see a lot of the nuts and bolts of testing. What was it like to switch to your current work at Medicinal Genomics? Um, so I have actually always been really fascinated by the work that Medicinal Genomics was doing, even what, before I was at the company. Um, the founder, Kevin McKernan, and I actually used to share literature all the time on Facebook because I am a moderator on this group called Cannabis Science and Chemistry. And um, I, I think he just kind of saw that my my finger was on the pulse, so to speak, with a lot of the research that was coming out. And so, um, and I had always kind of admired his work from afar because, well, I was turning a crank at a cannabis testing lab, just making sure samples got out on time. And, you know, once you learn all the analyses, it's like, well, what are you really doing at that point? If you're not learning, you're not, you know, challenging yourself and you're, you're not doing new things, you're not exploring. Um, and so uh, the transition was actually really refreshing because um, 
it, it's all, like I said, I've always been fascinated by the work that they've done and we can talk a bit more about uh, some of the work that really got me inspired, but um, it really got me back on the biology train, which I, I had missed it for so long. So um, yeah, it, it was, like I said, refreshing and uh, I was really happy to get back into that realm. And while I'm definitely no sequencing expert, um, I probably just know enough to be dangerous at this point. Um, I I definitely uh, have a passion for learning new things and every day I'm at work, I'm constantly being challenged and learning new things uh, that I didn't know before. Um, so it's it's been a really great transition. I'm actually really happy um, and I get to go out and fly out all over the place and interface and meet with, with all these people that are embarking on this new field that, you know, are most of them spring chickens to this. So I get to impart a lot of the knowledge that I gained uh, during my testing lab days in the early days um, and teach a new generation of scientists, which is really fulfilling. And so you're their West Coast field applications scientist. So what is what would your work look like uh, day to day? <laughs> that's that's funny. We, I actually just uh, had a conversation about this right before I jumped on this podcast. Um, so this will be pretty simple. Um, my day to day is kind of like uh, so it's really support for the products that we provide. So uh, medicinal genomics provides three different product SKUs primarily, um, and first would be our PathoSeq microbial testing, and that's coupled with our SensitiveX DNA extraction. We've designed two of those DNA extractions uh, for different matrices. So one of them would be for plant and flower matrices, and the other one would be for infused products and extracts. And um, what that looks like basically is um, troubleshooting for all these different SKUs. And um, then we've also got, besides the, the SensitiveX and the PathoSeq, um, we've got our UPCR line, which is essentially like a, a do-it-yourself PCR at home. What's really cool about this is uh, they've got these mini PCRs now that are quite literally just portable. Um, some of them can even operate directly from your phone. Um, so people who are out there in the field that want to get rapid answers for, okay, well, uh, does this plant have powdery mildew or not? Do I want to actually take this clone back into my grow room? Am I going to give my room plant aids, essentially? Um, so it's supporting all those products. Um, and then also when it comes to sequencing, we, we offer something called strain seek and that comes in two different varieties. Um, one is a, a smaller panel. So that covers 3.2 megabases. So that's 3.2 million bases. Um, and that's looking at primarily your cannabinoid and terpene synthase genes, um, and that whole family. Um, and then we've got a whole genome sequence as well, which is Basically, the well, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a whole genome shotgun, so it's the entire thing. Um, and that's useful in the context of things like intellectual property, where you're trying to show that your cultivar that you've, that you've bred is truly unique. Um, so really, my day-to-day -day is kind of like answering questions about that service um, and for the testing labs and uh, manufacturers or producers that are running any of these assays. Well, okay, so I'm getting weird data. What, what do I do? do to fix the problem and how do I get more accurate data out of, you know, where, where my process am I going wrong? Um, so a lot of it is uh, teaching these people different tips and tricks in order to ensure they get the best result possible. Um, so many times, and a lot of the time, it's a lot of chemists that I work with because, of course, testing labs, the majority of the analyses that they do are chemists. So they hire chemists um, and many times uh, they're brand new out of college don't have a whole lot of experience, but they know a bit about chemistry, but many of them don't know anything about molecular biology. Some of them have never even done a PCR before. Um, and, and even the worst cases, you know, have never really used a pipette. <laughs> uh, that, that has come, come across a couple times. So um, we provide protocols and everything um, in order to help guide these testing labs. But of course, um, everyone wants to get into testing and not everyone has VC funding or, you know, all the backing in the world. A lot of people are trying to do it out of their own pockets. So we get a lot of folks that you know want to take our protocols and kind of trim the fat, so to speak. But uh, when you're trimming fat, you're really cutting corners, and that's really going to compromise your data. So it's really looking into what they're doing in their processes and where they could improve on those processes in order to actually arrive at a better answer, or if they're not getting an answer at all, figuring out why that is. Um, that's fascinating. So you get to work with growers on the ground all the way up to chemists uh, with these various products. 
Exactly. And, you know, what I like to say about UPCR is we've essentially made molecular biology stoner proof with it. Um, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a cool way to get people who otherwise wouldn't be even holding a pipette to embark on this cool scientific journey and at the same time also help out with their operations and learn more about the plant as they go. Uh, and can you define PCR for us? So PCR is polymerase chain reaction. Um, and this was invented by a guy named Kerry Mullis. Uh, he was actually taking hallucinogens on the beach, as the story goes. Um, and he had this idea. I think he was working at Life Technologies at the time. Um, and he was thinking, well, how, how could we get DNA amplification to happen? Well, um, we know that if you heat DNA, uh, the double-stranded DNA, into uh, it, to a certain heat, so what we call a hot start at 95C, you'll get those two strands to come apart. And then um, his next idea was, well, we have complementary base pairing that happens with DNA. Well, if we have these short little pieces of DNA, what we, what we now know as primers, um, that are basically complementary to our upstream of our target sequence, and if I can get them to anneal, so that's the, the part where you, know, you cool it down from the hot start, and then those things will anneal to their complementary base pairs, and then I also throw in a polymerase into that reaction mixture, then won't the polymerase just recognize this as something where it just has to run with it? Um, and so, and then if I just do this heating and cooling over and over again, will I get an amplification of my target sequence that I'm hoping for? And, you know, so he's thinking outside the box here, he's in an altered state of mind, and then uh, sure enough, he gave it a go and uh, it worked. So uh, that's the story of PCR. And that's kind of like the, the general mechanics of how it works. Just a quick note here, in a PCR mix, you also need magnesium present, as well as dinucleotide triphosphates, the building blocks of DNA. And what's really fascinating about what your uh, company does, is, I think especially, is the microbial testing you're really working with the pathogenic bacteria, the, the toxigenic fungi, and the beneficial microbes that can grow on cannabis. And so can you talk about how um, you know, a grower wants to be doing a much better job would be using this to test what's on their plants? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, it's, so firstly, this is slightly different from PCR in the sense that this is quantitative PCR. So um, it's quantitative because this amplification event is now, it's basically you have, instead of just a primer, now you have a primer and a probe. And that probe basically has a quencher attached to it. So that's basically whenever it's just sitting in solution, uh, the fluorescence is not allowed to happen. But when you get this amplification event, what ends up happening is that that quencher gets removed and then fluorescence is emitted. And so this fluorescence is what the instrument is measuring. And that's how you get quantitative data out of the PCR reaction. Um, and so that's why we think it's also a really powerful tool is because, well, if you can get quantitative data out of this DNA application, you have targeted primers that are very specific to your target sequence, um, then you can get highly specific. And uh, what's really great about this is because it's targeted, you get a much better answer and you can get this answer much more rapidly than commonly used methods. Um, so things like plating, you can, it takes, you know, sometimes up to a week for some of these different fungi to grow on these media. So it's really helpful to be able to, well, in, in the case of a business case, you know, it's like you can get a same day answer rather than waiting. Um, and when we have people that are waiting on results to release product in the market, it's, uh, it's really helpful. But to jump back to your original question, which is how can this give people a better insight into cultivation and um, produce ultimately better product? Um, it's a, basically a good way of being able to rapidly screen for safety. Um, we know that there's a lot of pathogens out there that can be found in cannabis, and some of them are actually um, found commonly. They're, they're endophytes, so that, that means they, they're, they actually reside within the cannabis plant. They're not just on the surface. But of course, environmental environmental factors, things like if you're cultivating outdoors or in general, if you're growing in an area that's um, not well, um, I guess, uh, insulated or, you know, there, there's not filtration happening of the air that's incoming into your grow room, um, then 
fungal spores uh, can get in there. Um, if you're, I mean, in the case of uh, something like salmonella, are you fertilizing with something like chicken shit? Well, if you are, then you run the risk of potentially having salmonella on your product um, or coliforms or other things that could potentially not be so great to the end user. Um, and so having these rapid screens and the availability of these tests to, to get quick answers is extremely valuable. Um, and then also, like I was saying about the specificity, um, oftentimes when we look at uh, the culture plating methods that are available currently that are commonly used in food, um, when we sequence the stuff that's actually growing on those plates, it's often not the target organism that they're actually trying to measure. Uh, to give you an example, uh, Medicinal Genomics did a study uh, looking at some of the different methods that are currently available. Um, in this case, we looked at 3M, uh, the Petri film plates, and we also looked at BioMariU and their culture-based system. Uh, it's the Tempo. Um, and in both of these cases, oftentimes what we found when we sequenced uh, for total yeast and mold, we ended up finding up to 60% bacteria was growing on these plates. So ultimately, people are, were getting these inflated counts, a lot of uh, cultivators who you know spend tons of money on this testing to get their stuff to market are ultimately having their products failed because people are using one an antiquated technology that probably shouldn't be in use anymore at least not as widely as it is currently and two um, you're basically getting um, you're basically getting the wrong answer um, you know if you're if you're not being selective for the organism of interest then how can you really trust the data that's coming out of these things and um, ultimately it's going to lead to more failures and then people are going to look to things like fungicides. Um, maybe one that might ring a bell to your listeners here is Eagle 20 or microbutanil. Uh, and that one is commonly used on things like grapes, um, in, in wine country, but it's, that's a different route of administration when you, you know, you're consuming grapes, you're not smoking grapes. Um, and what's, really tricky about microbutanil is there is a cyano group on there. So uh, a cyanide group, essentially. Um, and so C with a triple bond to N. Um, and what happens when you heat the stuff is that cyano group will pop off. And what happens when that uh, occurs is you get hydrogen cyanide. So that's getting in people's lungs. Um, and basically, if you're going to fail people for... Uh, total count tests, things like total yeast and mold, they're going to use more fungicides. And when you use more fungicides, you're going to get more microbutanil around. And when you get more microbutanil around, you're going to have people inhaling hydrogen cyanide more often. So really, um, aside from the issue of not being able to get what is considered probably harmless product to market because the total count tests don't actually distinguish between what's pathogenic and what's benign, um, you're now also creating a public health risk because more people are spraying the stuff on their products. And as far as pathogens go, can you tell us more about aspergillus? Yeah, sure. So um, aspergillus is actually one of those endophytes in the cannabis plant that I was referring to earlier. Um, and the real problem with aspergillus is when it comes to immunocompromised patients or consumers of cannabis. So, of course, we all know cannabis is great as a medicine for those who are dealing with cancer or have autoimmune disorders and things like that. Um, but if an aspergillus spore happens to get into the lungs of one of these people, um, it could really cause some serious complications. Uh, in this case, it would produce something called aspergillosis, or it could. It doesn't always, but uh, it does have the potential to produce uh, something called aspergillosis, where essentially this fungi will colonize the lungs of the patient, um, and it can really cause some serious complications in the case of um, you basically get uh, a lung infection, and it can be fatal in some people. There's definitely a lot of documented cases of fatalities from aspergillosis. And what's uh, really concerning as well is it's not just limited to the folks that are immunocompromised. There are some case studies out there showing that perfectly healthy people do get these types of lung infections. And um, ultimately, it's just one of those things where it it's a public health issue, right? Um, people want to use cannabis recreationally. They also want to use it as a medicine. But um, we know this to be definitely something that's harmful and it does reside in the plant, but not all of it is pathogenic. So it's really important to distinguish between what is potentially disease causing and what is, uh, or I guess illness causing in this case, and what is not. 
I've been writing about cannabis and the endocannabinoid system for years. I've traveled the world to gather people's stories about cannabis and the history of our use of it. But at the time, the positive effects from CBD were only starting to dawn on me. Then I saw firsthand the impact it made in the health of my cousin and the comfort it gave my grandmother as she was passing. Since then, the many accounts I've heard from those using CBD from hemp made me a believer in its potential. CV Sciences works hard to produce the highest quality hemp supplements so people everywhere can experience CBD's benefits for themselves. I'm proud to be working with them to help spread the good work. Proud because I know we lead the industry in research and education. Proud because I know we make excellent CBD supplements from true agricultural hemp. But I'm most proud because I know our products make a difference in people's lives. At pluscbdoil.com, use the coupon code LEXFILES for 20% off to see for yourself. And one of the things you mentioned in uh, one of the papers we'll link to in the episode notes is that this fungi doesn't grow as well on the standard culture plates that are used out there. So it can tend to be underreported using the methods that are usually used. Yes, correct. So, um, and it's not to say that it won't grow at all. It just, this is one of those things where it takes anywhere from five to seven days to completely enumerate on a plate. And it is underreported in the sense that um, what we get in terms of recovery, um, when we compare, say, a DNA-based method to a culture plating method, um, the recovery is substantially reduced um, in like hundreds, hundreds of fold less. Um, so that can really generate some false negatives in that regard. And so if you get false negatives and you're dealing with someone who's already sick and immunocompromised, then uh, that could really lead to some serious problems down the line. Um, and I mean, with the world that we're living in in cannabis now, um, everyone's really quick to go to litigation. I mean, we see this all the time with things like pesticides. Like one example I can think of off top is uh, Brass Knuckles uh, recently got sued for um, basically advertising their stuff as pesticide free. Um, and then when people spot checked them and took stuff off the shelf and tested it, uh, it came up with loads of pesticides. Um, so yeah, in this litigious world that we live in, uh, and these testing labs really want to be a hundred percent sure that if there is a microbial threat in the samples that they're testing, that they pick it up. Um, and that's another reason why things like enrichment are really important. Um, uh, for those of your listeners who aren't really familiar with microbiology or the concept of enrichment, um, imagine it like this. So, um, if there's a very, very small amount of something in a sample that you're testing, um, let's use the idea of a needle in a haystack. Well, if you don't allow the needle in the haystack to multiply, and in this case, what we call the enrichment is basically letting your sit, your sample sit in a, a growth medium and incubating it at the proper uh, incubation temperature. If you're not letting it grow and multiply enough to the point where you can hit the target, then essentially you're, you're going to miss it. Um, it's a statistical thing, right? Especially if you're taking subsamples out of a larger portion to try and do detection. Uh, you need to ensure that you give that ample time to, to multiply and grow in order to hit it. Um, so with aspergillus, it's just one of those things where if you're not employing the proper methodology and you're not being careful, it could really end up uh, being a bad situation for everyone involved, both on the producer end, both on the testing lab end, and for the end user. And so just to summarize a little bit, it's that the cannabis plant has this microbiome that's different on the inside of the plant and the outside of the plant. And currently the tests are being done on culture plates, but a lot of things don't grow on culture plates and your company is using DNA. Um, and so my practical question is, how do you see different states handling this problem of wanting to test for this stuff when it's so complicated? Well, and that's where my job comes in, a lot of what I do is education, and that's not just at the testing lab or you know the operator level of who's using our tests. It's for regulators and people who are trying to get a handle on how to properly um, regulate the industry and make sure that what is going to market is safe. And uh, many of these people don't have a background in cannabis, that's for sure. Um, they're they're still learning, just like everyone else, as we as we chart into the unknown, um, but what they need to really realize is that, yes, it's a unique matrix. It has 
it, its own challenges. And these challenges are something that they need to learn about in order to make the proper educated decision. Um, and another example of exactly why you would want to go with a DNA based method is um, these plating methods won't pick up things like endophytes because in order to actually pick up endophytes, um, you have to break open the plant and actually get those uh, bacteria and fungi out. Um, and how you do that without, um, you know, actually breaking open plant cells, then that's, that's going to be problematic. Um, and furthermore, there's other things that we find in the cannabis microbiome that are, are I guess, atypical um, compared to some of the other analyses that you see. Um, things like endofungal pathogens. Um, back in, actually around this time last year, um, we embarked on kind of a sequencing project uh, where we were trying to figure out well, we see differences between culture and plating methods and qPCR. Well, what are the underlying differences in the microbiome where we see discordance uh, in the samples between what's being plated and what's being run on qPCR? And what we ended up finding was when we actually sequenced the amplicons that had come out of this. So um, uh, for the listeners, let me give a little more detail there. Um, when we're doing something like a total aerobic plate count, so for aerobic bacteria, um, we're using primers that are targeting uh, the 16S ITS region. So ITS stands for internally transcribed spacer regions. Um, and so those regions are evolutionarily conserved in, in bacteria. And so, and it's particular aerobic bacteria. So we'll amplify that region to look for what aerobic bacteria might be present. And similarly, in the context of total yeast and molds, we have an 18S ITS region, and we'll amplify those regions to try and figure out what exactly is growing in terms of total yeast and molds. And so when you amplify these things, you get the amplicons that are generated out of them. And those amplicons, we can then sequence. And when we sequence them, um, those amplicons kind of act like a unique molecular barcode in, in that they're, they're very variable, but they're also very specific to different genuses and species, and sometimes down to the species level. It's not always perfect down to the species level, but when you upload this stuff into something like a metagenomic database, you can get a microbiome ID out of this. And so what we did was we, when we did both of those um, assays and we did a microbiome ID on this, um, we found one common underlying theme uh, in the samples where there was discordance. And that underlying theme was the presence of a bacteria called Ralstonia. And Ralstonia is an endofungal bacteria. So this means it's a bacteria that resides inside of fungal cells. And so good luck detecting uh, an endofungal bacteria with a plating method because you're never going to be able to see it because the cells aren't being broken open in order to actually get them to grow. And um, so just another reason why molecular methods are going to be helpful in this scenario. And Ralstonia is a pathogen to both plants and humans. Uh, specifically, uh, it's been shown to cause lung infections in certain patient populations, people with cystic fibrosis in particular, but other immunocompromised populations could certainly be susceptible to this type of infection as well. Good. Thank you for sharing on that. The other part I wanted to make sure we had time to get to was the work that you've been doing with the Jamaican lion genome. Yeah, and that was actually a really cool project. So um, last year, when we had kind of the cryptocurrency boom that happened, um, suddenly a lot of these crypto companies had a lot of money to throw around. And one of the companies that we felt was doing uh, a great service to the community was uh, called Dash. Uh, Dash is essentially digital cash. Um, and what they do is they have grant proposals. And so this is a basically an autonomously governed, really basically the stakeholders in the currency. Um, they govern themselves and they kind of vote on who gets funds to go to a certain project. Um, and so we applied for one of these grants and uh, the proposal was to sequence a type two plant. So that's a plant that has both CBD and THC producing genes and deeply sequence it so that we could understand the genetics of the plant better. Um, and so after a lot of nail biting and getting down to the wire, uh, we needed a certain amount of votes to, to get this grant and we ended up getting it. And so uh, we took the funds and we decided to embark on this project uh, using a combination of different techniques. So 
uh, the first was first the first part of the project was isolating high molecular weight DNA um, in order to actually get get good enough quality DNA to do the sequencing work, which is actually really no easy task in cannabis, um, especially because it's a really complex matrix that expe- expresses you know up to thirty percent cannabinoids and terpenes and all these things that can really be problematic for molecular biology. So the first challenge was to get good enough quality DNA in order to do the sequencing. Then once we actually got good enough quality DNA, then we applied sequencing technologies like PacBio. Um, now, there's two kind of big players in DNA sequencing. There's there's more than that, really. But uh, two of the ones that stand out that are kind of the well the most well-known um, are Illumina and PacBio. And so we didn't use Illumina. Um, that is what we call short-read sequencing, and there's a reason for that. Um, but basically, cannabis is extremely polymorphic. So that means that there's a lot of variation within the genome. And so to give you some context, um, the human genome has a SNP or a single nucleotide polymorphism every one in 100 base pairs, roughly. Now, the cannabis genome has a SNP every one in 40 base pairs. And in the areas under selection, you've got a SNP every one in 25 base pairs. So that's four, four, fourfold more um, complex than the human genome is. So with all that different variation, and you have, and if you're applying something like short read technology, where you get these little, little, uh, I guess, stretches of, of DNA, it's really hard to actually assemble that into a picture if there's so much variability and repeatability in, uh, within that, that genome. So um, short read technology without a, a reference or a more complete picture, which we didn't have at the time, um, is really hard to make use of anything. So we applied Pike biotechnology, which is long read sequences. So when you have longer reads, essentially you're able to get a much better picture of what's going on, and these things actually map a lot better as a result. So the first step was getting a ton of long reads with packed bio data. Um, and then the next step that we applied was uh, a technology called HiC from Phase Genomics. And what HiC does basically is it it creates um, it, it creates basically maps of where things link in terms of chromosomes. So um, there's what they call bisulfite conversion, which is another techno or another method really um, that people used to try and do this, but it's wrought with false positives. It's not exactly the cleanest way of doing it. And it really beats the hell out of the DNA as one of my colleagues says. Um, so it makes it really tricky to, to get the stuff to work exactly perfectly. But with high C and uh, this technology from phase genomics, you get these structures and in a much more precise manner, which basically allows you to take all this long read sequencing data and create chromosomal structures out of it. And now that we have chromosomal structures, in cannabis there are 10 chromosomes, and so now we can actually see all the, the little details that we weren't able to before, where we were failing to put the pieces of the puzzle together because they were just tiny little fragments. There were a gazillion of them. You had no, no idea where they really went. Now we know where they go and where they all map. Um, and so what was really cool about this project was it was done in under 120 days. And I can't take much credit for it. Um, that is definitely the hard work of our sequencing team and our R&D team and Kevin for championing this whole DASH project. Um, it, it's really been um, quite the history in the making to watch. And uh, there's new improvements happening right now. We're actually doing something with PacBio called the Cannabis Pan Genome Project, where essentially we're taking this now and we're doing this to a whole family of different cannabis genomes. And so by doing that, we can really tease out some of more of the intricacies and regulatory elements and structures associated with the cannabis genome and figure out what does all this stuff do. It's fascinating. You get to go so deep into the genome of this stuff. Um, And the last part I wanted to ask before we let you go was about your more public work because you're working with the American Chemical Society as their vice chair for cannabis chemistry subdivision, um, which I think is really impressive because the American Chemical Society is fairly conservative. And for them to be getting into cannabis, I think it take, you know it takes leaders like you pushing this forward. So I was wondering what it's like to be working with them. 
Well, well, first and foremost, I, I definitely cannot take all the credit for uh, getting the American Chemical Society to accept us as a subdivision within the Department of Chemical Health and Safety. Um, that came from some uh, some pioneers who uh, I really have a lot of respect for. Um, Ezra Pryor has been a mentor of mine for a number of years now, and he's the one who actually kind of championed this along with Jehan Marku. Um, and Melissa Wilcox and Mark Scaldone, and I'm sure there are a couple others that I'm missing here, but um, I got brought into the ACS around 2015, um, and I actually started as their social media coordinator. So I was just kind of trying to raise awareness within the community that, well, you know, there is this conservative organization that is really trying to include us, um, and because, I mean, Cannabis, it's still chemistry, right? Um, and this is the world's biggest chemistry society, and we deserve a seat at this table too. Now, granted, we're a subdivision. We aren't a full technical division. We're housed within the Department of Chemical Health and Safety. So we are still governed by the Department of Chemical Health and Safety. We have to play by the rules, um, and we we need to ensure that uh, we are doing everything in, in alignment with what their mission is as well. Um but it's been really cool to to meet a lot of the the budding cannabis chemists in this industry and offer just kind of a scientific forum for people to exchange ideas and to network and to just really learn more about the best practices because um as i mentioned there's a lot of people out there cutting corners right now that aren't necessarily doing it the right way and it's because not necessarily out of ignorance but a lack of guidance. I mean, I'm sure that there are some smart people that are trying to cut corners that are doing it because, well, I'm trying to save money. But most people are doing it simply because they don't have resources available to them to actually do it the right way. Um, and so that's what CAN is all about fostering. It's making sure that people interact with the scientific community and get to know their peers and share their work so that we can all move forward together collectively and do this the right way. Um, we have a lot of problems out there currently with lab testing for be it inconsistent test results or bad methodology or simply bad actors where people are dry labbing. But I think if we come together as a community and we all get to know each other and what each other's doing, um, we can really raise the tide for all boats by doing this. Um, so it's been really awesome to work with the team at CAN. Um, and like, like you mentioned, I'm now, vice chair of the organization. So it's been really awesome to watch all these cannabis chemists grow into the scientists that they are today and really to just mentor the new generation because there's tons of fresh graduates that are coming out of school and seeing cannabis testing as this emerging new field and they want to get involved, but there really isn't a whole lot of knowledge base or resources out there. And so we'd like to be that resource for them. And it's been a really great opportunity to, to showcase um, the work that's been done by others, I mean, uh, we all stand on the shoulders of giants, right? So um, being able to pass the torch of knowledge on to this new generation has just been really awesome. And it's been a real pleasure to do it. That's great. Uh, and we'll link to uh, the CAN uh, division, subdivision in, uh, in the episode notes for any budding uh, scientists out there. Which brings us to the last point. Um, you have a, the CAN has the first scholarship for cannabis scientists available, correct? That is true. Yeah. So, um, so that scholarship started last year uh, with a generous donation from Heidolf North America. Um, they're a manufacturer of lab equipment, um, things like rotavaps and alike. And um, so they gave us this very generous donation it, for five years to basically um, give money out to people who are doing research in the space. Um, and what it does for them is it essentially provides funding for them to fly out to the ACS national meeting. This happens every spring uh, for the scholarship. Um, and basically, they get to present their work and share their ideas with their peers. Uh, we give away up to $1,500 per recipient to reimburse those travel funds. And um, it's really open to anybody. Um, we don't, you don't necessarily have to be a degreed scientist or a PhD. You don't, you don't need to be a student. This is open to anyone who has good ideas that they feel needs to be shared with the community. Um, and so it's, it's a great opportunity just to get your name out there. Um, we've had a lot of great talks. Uh, the inception of this award, uh, we had seven different recipients. Um, and initially, I should take a step back. Initially, this was not, currently we call it the El Soli Award. 
Uh, initially, this was not called the El Soli Award. It, it had this very clunky name, actually, called the Kanchajna Award. Um, so that was Can uh, Chaz, so Can Cannabis Chemistry Subdivision, Chaz, uh, Department of Chemical Health and Safety, and HNA, Heidolf North America. Uh, we called it the Hash Award for short that year. Um, but of course, that wasn't a very sexy name, now was it? <laughs> so uh, we we changed it up, um, and we felt we need to honor somebody who's made big contributions to the field of cannabis science, and we felt that Mahmoud El Soli was a great candidate for that. Um, of course, people would sometimes give me flack because, oh, well, you know, he's got the only research license out at Old Miss, and he grows, you know, whatever, you know, not the greatest cannabis used for research purposes, but hey, at least there is somebody out there doing it. And, you know, he's kind of done the best he can with the cards that he's been dealt because he has to deal with the federal government. And uh, you, you don't get to grow the bomb, so to speak, <laughs> um, if you're working with a government agency. You're kind of, you, you deal with the hands, the cards you're dealt, right? Um, and so I think aside from all the controversy there, I think he's done a whole lot of work to support the industry and get us uh, to have better products. Uh, one that comes to mind is things like THC hemisuccinate and all the different uh, derivatives that he's used and all the different delivery methods that he's developed. Um, and, and this is taking more of a pharmaceutical approach, granted, but he is very well published. Um, he does have a lot of literature out there that he's published that is substantial in terms of contributions to the field. So we wanted to honor him and we're really grateful to have the award named after him. Um, and for those who are interested in applying for the El Soli Award, um, I encourage you to submit an abstract and a resume. Um, those are all due July 1st to Award at gmail.com. And Lex, I'm sure you'll put that in the show notes as well. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for that call out. It'll be great to see the array of voices. Um, and so thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and for your work with CAN and spreading the knowledge and all the, uh, all the learning we got to do today. Thanks for having me, Lex. It was truly a pleasure and uh, I look forward to hearing it. <laughs> Thanks. Until next time. Thanks for tuning in. To listen to other episodes, find us at pluscbdoil.com slash lexfiles. If you have any questions, compliments, or suggestions, feel free to write me at research at cvsciences.com. If you enjoyed the program, please rate us on iTunes and share a link to your social media. It means a lot to us. The Lex Files is produced by Matt Payne. Our chief advisor is Amabel De La Cruz. The music is by Jake Bradford Sharp. Our sponsor is CV Sciences, maker of America's favorite CBD oil. And remember the coupon code LexFiles. I'm Lex Pelger, signing off.